All right, without further ado, let's get into this. Welcome to Unclog Your Stuck Pipeline. Again, this is clearly a topic that has, um, that uh, uh, people see, uh, it's hit a nerve. Who am I? I'm Blair Enns. I assume you know a little bit about me if you're here. Um, you might know me from such books as The Win Without Pitching Manifesto, published in 2010. It's available on Amazon.com. Or Pricing Creativity, A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour. That was published in 2018. It's available only at pricingcreativity.com. Actually, that will redirect to a page at winwithoutpitching.com. Um, I also, I'm also the co-host of two podcasts. The first uh, is called Two Bob's Conversations on the Art of Creative Entrepreneurship. I have co-hosted this with my good friend and colleague, David C. Baker, since 2017. We actually started recording the first episodes in late 2015 and it took us a year uh, before we decided that we were actually going to start to air them. So I think what I'm horrible at math, but I think this is year seven that we've been on the air. And then my more recent podcast uh, is called 20% The Marketing Procurement Podcast. You think it's a, it's a niche topic uh, where my co-host Leah Power and I are trying to solve the marketing procurement problem. Now, you might think, well, if you might not have a problem with your client's procurement departments, but I would suggest to you that there are some gems of episodes in this podcast, including the one that dropped today, an interview with Christy Labor, who spent 20 years client side in CPG uh, firms in branding and innovation roles, senior positions at big companies like Pepsi and Kraft Heinz, um, and who's now agency side. So I just finished listening to that episode. It's a fantastic one. So even if you're not interested in the area of marketing procurement, there are a lot of great conversations with agency people, mostly with procurement people, but also with brand side marketers. So I'm learning a ton from this podcast and I suggest that you might too. So that's me. My day job is being founder. I wanted to say running, but that's Shannon's job. Uh, my day job is being founder of Win Without Pitching. So we're a sales training and coaching organization for creative professionals for over 20 years now. Seems weird to say that. We've helped advertising design and digital agencies reach new levels of revenue and margin growth. And it's primarily through this idea of win without pitching, pitch free selling and value-based pricing. Shannon, you're back. Did you want to comment on something? I don't actually. I'm going to leave again. All good. Okay. Um, you can learn more at winwithoutpitching.com. There are two ways that we help firms like yours. One is through public workshops that we run three times a year, three times a year. The last one was in May. The next one is in September. Um, September one started selling immediately after the May one. Uh, it's a great way to dip your toe into, maybe it's more than dip your toe. It's basic training on new business development, the one without pitching way. So you can learn more at this shortened URL, www.tv slash workshop, or you can just go to winwithoutpitching.com and search for workshops. And the second way we help is, is under the category of other through private engagements. So if, if a public workshop doesn't work for you or isn't enough for you, or you have specific new business problems you want help with, reach out to us and uh, we will craft an engagement, whether it's coaching, training, other forms of consulting and advisory services, audits, whatever it is, um, we'll explore whether or not we can help you. All right, here's our agenda. Uh, four things, really. First, I'll just speak very quickly about the state of the business, what's going on in the world, economically speaking. Then we'll get to kind of the crux of it. What is it that your clients are thinking and feeling in this environment. And then I will give you a simple framework for uh, getting stuck deals moving again. So that's the name of this podcast or sorry, webinar. It's uh, unclogging your stuck pipeline. That's what we're going to talk about. The assumption is that you have deals in the pipeline and they're just not moving or they're moving really slow, or maybe you're, you're not closing them. Maybe they're closed lost because of the macroeconomic conditions. What we're not going to talk about today is lead generation. So if you have a lead generation problem, you're in the wrong webinar. 
Um, and then again, I'm going to try to leave a minimum 15 minutes, hopefully 20 minutes for discussion, because I think a lot of the value is in the discussion. But before we get into the state of the economy, let's do a quick poll. I'd like to get a sense of just how everybody is feeling about the financial landscape in 2023. So Avery, do you want to publish that poll? There we go. So how optimistic are you about your 2023 financial performance? Multiple choice, very optimistic, somewhat somewhat pessimistic, very pessimistic. And we can see these, where I can see these results coming in. I don't know if you guys can. Um, so we have 400, we have 500 of you on the line, 504 and... Yeah. Okay. I think that's pretty good, Avery. Those numbers don't appear to be moving anymore if you want to share the results. So this is, this is uh, better than, this is, this is better than I feared that we would see. So it's really in the middle leaning towards somewhat optimistic. And this really just speaks to kind of the language that we used when we introduced the webinar there's no, there's very little panic in the market. There is this sense of um, uncertainty. There's a sense of uh, there's still opportunity out there. It's just moving slowly. So this aligns with what I'm seeing. I was in the UK two weeks ago. And at the beginning of the speech, I asked for just a show of hands on how optimistic people were. It's not as positive in the UK as it is in uh, North America right now. We'll talk about that. Well, let's talk about that now. Let's get to the state of the state of business. So, like the poll shows, there's some optimism, some mild optimism, some mild pessimism, very little um, extreme versions of both. So there's just uncertainty in the marketplace. There doesn't seem to be a sense of panic. I have heard of firms going out of business over the last little while. But you know, when a firm goes out of business, usually it's a combination of two things. It's like a steady pressure and then a pulse. And the pulse now is the macroeconomic conditions. And it's not a recession. It's not, well, maybe it is a recession, but it's not is it's not like when everything ground to a halt at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but if you're if you had business challenges, if you had financial challenges coming into the start of this year, then maybe you weren't able to weather the first few months of the year. My own sense is that in North America, things have started to loosen. And my sense is I'm checking in with people every day. My colleagues and I were checking in with each other, with agency owners and um, other people in the space. We're checking in pretty much every day. And my sense is based on this checking in, that things have started to loosen up in the last two weeks or so in North America. Now, if you read the headlines, the economy is pretty pretty strong in the U.S. in particular, but we also still have high inflation. Its latest numbers in the U.S. are four percent, half less than half of what they were at the peak within the last year. I think inflation in the United States peaked at nine point one percent. I'm not an economist. I don't mind rattling off these numbers. Anyway, so we have this optimism. We have deal flow starting to loosen up in the US. I don't think the UK, and these are the only two markets that I can speak to now, maybe in the chat, you can give us a sense of what's going on in your market. I know we have some clients in Argentina, they're getting devastated by uh, by the macroeconomic conditions there. Um, but I'd love to hear from people down under what's going on. Most of those people are listening to this on record because it's 2 a.m. What's happening in continental Europe, et cetera. So please share what you're seeing in the chat. When it comes to sectors, the whole tech startup realm is now is compared to the last decade, it's seriously underfunded. Unless your clients are in AI, then there's all kinds of money for AI. But was it Reed Hoffman? Who, who's the founder of LinkedIn? I think it's Reed Hoffman. There are all these reads out there who wrote the book. I think it's called blitz scaling. He basically coined the term that in the startup world, profit doesn't matter. It's about the speed to scale that's out the window again, unless it's AI and the normal business metrics of, of operating margin, cash flow, profit, EBIT, these apply in tech again. So that whole world has been turned upside down in the large CPG space. What you're seeing with your existing clients and some new clients is um, 
you're a cheaper source of financing than banks are. So you're getting pressure on terms. All, you're, some of you are operating under already onerous terms and the pressure on those terms to get even longer and longer payment terms. I mean, that's there in small business. Small business owners tend to be nervous. Parts of that has to do with what's going on in their personal lives. Some of that is tied to mortgages and variable rate mortgages. It's interesting. I saw the stat recently in the US. I didn't know this. I'm in Canada. Very few home mortgages are on variable rates. They're almost all fixed rates. <clears throat> in the in Canada, it's high. In the UK, it's even higher. So if you have a variable rate mortgage and you're you're living on a certain income, you've got to renew that mortgage. You, the The cost of your mortgage is going up and up and up. And um, some people say there's some financial implications to come. So that's just me pretending to be an economist for a few minutes. <clears throat> um, different economies have different situations. Your clients in different sectors have different situations. Overall, it's a sense of uncertainty, not panic. There's still optimism in the market. Okay, that's kind of what's going on externally. What's more important is what is going on internally in the minds and hearts of your clients. What is it that they are thinking and feeling? And I want to suggest to you that there are five main thoughts when it comes to that opportunity, that project that you're working on, that maybe you've already put a proposal forward and you have not ha had a response. It's just kind of stuck in your pipeline. The five things that they are likely thinking that are causing this deal to be stuck. Number one, an issue of timing. Okay. Do we really need to do this now? Um, can this wait? Is there any urgency? What happens if we wait six months? What happens if we push it off to the next calendar year? Second is opportunity cost. Is this money better spent elsewhere? And these two factors, these two decisions around should the timing be now or should it be pushed off into the future? And should this money be spent here or should it be spent somewhere else? Some of those decisions are being made by your actual clients who are maybe small business owners or in senior positions in their organization. And some of your clients are having those decisions made for them. They're out of their hands. And so, as you'll see, we'll get here in a few minutes. We really want to get to this place where you're actually having more open and honest and direct conversations with your clients. It's a heart of, it's part of what we want to get to here. We're, we're guessing at some of these things. We need to quit guessing. The other thing they're thinking is performance risk. And again, these five points, they apply all the time. Right. What's different now is we have this backdrop of uncertainty. We have this kind of steady pressure. Now, these decisions, they're higher risk decisions than they were six months ago. Performance risk. How confident am I, am I that I'm going to get the outcomes that I'm looking for? Or otherwise stated, how confident am I, the client, in your ability to do this for me? So performance risk, ROI. Okay, even if you hit these number, even if you do this, is it really worth it? Is it worth the price that you're asking me to pay? I don't want to dwell on this. I'm not here to tell you to cut price. There are other things that we can do. Cutting price is always an option. It's the option of last resort as far as I'm concerned. And if you're going to do it, do it right. Then the last issue is complexity. Now, I don't know if, if uh, Mike, Mike Lander is a friend who has a podcast called Marketing Negotiations. I think it's called the Drum Marketing Negotiations Podcast. Mike, if you're on here and you want to post the link, go ahead and post the link. So he recently in two different episodes interviewed two, the two authors of The Challenger Sale, um, Brent and Matt, Dixon and Adam, but I always get the last names mixed up, uh, in two different interviews. And in both of those interviews, one of the topics that came up was, you know, why do deals get stuck? And and one of these guys had an answer, and it's and it's a highly studied answer, I think, that said, well, it's really deals get stuck because the client has a fear of messing up. Their fear of commission is bigger than high is higher than the fear of omission. It's safer to make the mistake of not taking action than it is to make a mistake, take action and fail. <laughs> But the other author had a better answer. He said, the real answer is, this is hard. And, and his response hit me in my gut. And uh, you, you know, we, when you, 
you can feel the truth in your body sometimes. I had one of these moments where it's like, we just need to recognize that our clients are in difficult situations. When they hire us, these are usually really big, complex decisions. There are lots of people involved. There are people they have to answer to. <clears throat> there are trade-offs they have to make in the decision that we are not even aware of. We may never be aware of. It's just complex. It's hard. They have other things they have to do. They have competing priorities. The other decision makers have competing priorities. It sounds so obvious, but when this was brought up in this discussion, I just it just really hit me that we, and maybe I was seeing in my own behavior that I am not recognizing how difficult it is in our clients to hire us. That's probably what was happening. And I think this translates. And so we'll get to what do we do about this, but part of it is, I think if we can just stop and recognize these are the main reasons, the first two are sometimes out of our hands and the last three are really the ones I want to focus on. What can we do to help these deals get stuck where the client is in this background of uncertainty. They're worried about, well, can we really do this? And is it worth it? And this last one, it's just hard, Blair. It's like, <clears throat> yeah, I've got to hire you to help me or somebody like you to help me get these results. But I've got all these other things and I've got all of these other pressures, et cetera. If you want a glimpse into the pressures your clients are under, listen to today's episode that dropped today, 20% the Marketing Procurement Podcast episode with Christy Labor. <clears throat> and you get a sense of the the, the pressure clients are under. So I think if we can recognize that this is hard and we can speak to how hard this is and what can I do to make this easier for you, that's part of the solution. So that's what clients are thinking and feeling. Let me give you a simple three, maybe four, maybe there's a bonus step in the framework, three-step framework for helping get deals unstuck. Step one, Let's, we're, I was going to say quit guessing. We'll start with guessing, but let's ask the question first, like, why is this particular deal stuck? Why is it stuck? And again, you know, we, we talked about the reasons and the, the five in the middle are the ones that I just referenced. The one at the top is, I didn't reference. Sometimes budgets are just frozen out of your client's hand. The, there might be a deal in your pipeline that is stuck where it's like that client has been told you can't spend this money now. And the client has not passed that information on to you. It's a, a win without pitching principle. We teach this in our, all of our training. A key principle is to say what you're thinking. So if you're thinking, oh, I think this is stuck. I wonder if this is stuck because of this reason. You want to build that muscle that has you speak to that, to the client. Don't just guess. So if you're thinking something, speak to it, put it to the client and ask. So the budget might be frozen, but then there's this issue of timing, opportunity cost, performance risk, ROI, uncertainty, and complexity. And then there might be others as well. So step one, why is this stuck? So first, I want you to look at your pipeline report. So you've got your opportunities and they might be listed by size. They're probably listed by age and go from the oldest to the newest. Review the pipeline. And then simply ask yourself and your team, why do we think this is stuck? And list the reason or reasons why you think each opportunity might be stuck. And then more importantly, once you have your hypothesis for why this might be stuck, ask the client. You can lead the client and say, hey, I'm getting the sense that um, you're <clears throat> having difficulty in making this decision just because the complexity, there's so many people have to be in involved. And I'm sure everybody's under a lot of pressure. This must feel really hard right now. Is that correct? Yeah. Thanks for saying that, Blair. I, that's exactly what's going on. Okay, great. Is any anything else going on? We always do these, like when we're uncovering objections, and that's effectively what I just did there. We think of this idea of the final sweep for objections. So we uncover the objection and think, oh, that's it. If I can overcome this objection, we're home free. Uh-uh, not so fast. This final sweep of, is there anything else? And then even a trial close of, if I could help you deal with that, do you think we could move forward on this project? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay. So it sounds like there's something else. Yeah, there's something else. So 
Um, look at your pipeline report, ask yourselves, why is this stuck? Build your hypothesis, go to the client, ask, be understanding, be empathic. I'm getting the sense this is getting, this is getting ground down or this is grinding to a halt because of this reason. Is that correct? No. Is it something else? Is there anything else? Maybe a trial close. If I could help you with this, is it possible we could get this thing moving again? That's step one. Why is this stuck? Step two is to lift the client's gaze. What do I mean by that? Well, some of you have heard me talk about this for years, maybe with this language, maybe with other language. But if you think of the arc of the sale or the arc of the sale from the from the client's point of view, it's really the buying journey um, that sometimes roughly reflects your point of view from the, as the sales. It's really the buying journey. So early on in the buying journey, clients overweigh the positive outcomes or benefits of working with a firm like yours. They look at the your case studies, they look at the beautiful work that you've done for others, and they try it on and they imagine what it's like to have results this good. This is this is how we all move through the stages of change in life. And that is a great proxy for stages of buying. So early on, we overweight the positives, the benefits of change, the things that might happen, and we underweight the negatives. And then as we get closer to the decision, in this case, buying, that dynamic flips and we start to underweight the positives and we start to overweight the negatives, the, the consequences of failure or the cost, the complexity, all how hard this is going to be. So we talk about inspire the interested, people who are interested in change, and then reassure the intent. Once they form the intent to act, our, our job sit, switches from inspiration to reassurance. So what do I mean by lift their gaze? I always think of early on, the client's gaze is on the horizon. They're, they're focused on the possibilities of what might be, the change that you might help bring to their organization, the value that you might help to create. And they get all inspired and they engage with you, not in the engagement itself, but they start talking to you in the sales cycle and things are really positive at first. Then you get into the nitty gritty. They get into the decision making. The closer they get to making the decision, the more their gaze drops. And they start to focus less on what might go well and more on what might go wrong. So the consequences of failure, the costs to do this in financial terms, in terms of their opportunity costs, the attention that they would have to divert from other things, all of these things rise to the surface. And when deals get stuck, this almost, regardless of why they get stuck, when they get stuck long enough, when you lose momentum on the deal, this is almost always happening. The client, the more the, the longer the client stays in this space, the more buyer's remorse sets in. It's known as buyer's remorse after they buy, but it's essentially the same thing that happens before they buy. So their gaze has dropped from the horizon of possibilities to all of these, all of these reasons why this might not make sense now. And your job is to go back in there and lift the client's gaze and say, hey, remember why we're here. Remember why we're trying to accomplish this. And I'll give you a framework for this. Um, this was taught to me oh, 20 years ago by a friend and former colleague, Pauline O'Malley. It's called the three R's. It stands for uh, restate the objection in your own words, reassure the client that everything's going to be okay, and then resume the pitch or the conversation. So restate, reassure, resume. And this comes from a the field of conflict management. So first, restate the objection in your own words. It sounds like, listen, I understand that. And we're not mirroring the language exactly. We're not saying exactly to them what they said to us. They said the problem is very specific problem. We don't say, hey, we, we don't use the same language back. We use our own language to prove that we're listening, that we've on, we're, not just, we're not just repeating things. We've heard. We understand, we've processed it, and we've given it back to you, the client, in our own words. I understand what situ I understand that you're concerned about getting all the all of your team members on board and the political capital that you, you're going to have to spend on this project. I understand 
the implications. I understand your concern about, you know, what happens if we, if we don't accomplish this. So whatever it is in your own words, showing that you understand. The second R is to reassure the client. So it usually begins with my objective is to help you or my goal is to, and this is where you do feed the client's own words back to them. The benefits they are looking to achieve through working with you, the value they're hoping to create through working with you. My objective is to help you drive 20,000 new marketing qualified leads, gain the number one, regain the number one share position in the category, um, launch the new product and immediately hit this number of sales, whatever the objective is. My objective is to help you get this thing that you came to me for, and you were really excited about, and this is, and you accomplishing this is going to be a milestone in your career. My objective is to help you accomplish this. And then the resume often starts with words. I'm sure you'll agree. Not always. I'm sure you'll agree that. So let's say the objection is timing. I'm sure you'll agree that once we accomplish these goals, we'll look back and you will be grateful that you didn't flinch in times of economic uncertainty. So that's just one example. I'm sure you'll agree that when we look back on this, the cost, the ROI is just going to be silly. I'm sure you will agree that, um, well, let me, let me move to the next one. Um, So I understand you're feeling this. My objective is to help you reach these goals. I'm sure you'll agree that when we hit these goals, we're going to look back on this objection and it's going to seem silly. Don't use that language exactly. You might want to, but that's your call. But the third third R might be um, you offering to help. And this is moving into step three of the framework, which is to address the specific objection. Would it be helpful to you if I was able to And now we get to step three. So step one is to ask, why is this stuck? Step two is to lift the client's gaze off of the problems, all the reasons why they're not doing this onto the reason they came to you in the first place. Get them re-energized, refocused, re-inspired to take some risk in times of uncertainty. And then step three, and you can do it as the third R is to address the specific challenge. And I'll give you eight specific tactics that you might use to address those five things, five things that clients are thinking about. The first one is, and most of these I've talked about for years. So some of you, if you're veterans of the old win without pitching webcast or win without pitching training, you've heard me talk about them. Let's just put them all together in one place. Whether it's complexity, ROI, so many other challenges, so many other objections, and an objection is a reason not to do business together, potential reason not to do business together. So many other objections can be overcome if you revisit the proposal that you originally delivered and come back to the client and say, hey, I know I asked you to make a big commitment in time and in money, and I know there are times of uncertainty right now. Would it be helpful to you if we broke the engagement up into steps or phases so that your level of commitment in both time and money, and maybe even the resources of people on your team is a lot smaller. We'll take this in bite-sized chunks. Under that idea of breaking the engagement up into steps or phases, is the idea that the first phase is usually some form of diagnostic. It's either a pilot project. Let's just do this small part over here and see what we get. Then we can talk about, does it make sense to roll it out into larger parts of the organization? So a pilot or an audit where you go in to assess the situation, to validate the client's hypothesis of what the problem is and what the solution might be, to validate your own hypothesis of what the problem might be with the solutions and therefore what the solutions might be. And they might be contradictory with the client. So you might be settling, not an argument, but some tension around what's really going on here. And then not not only to, um, to audit and validate, but to quantify. And you can say, why don't we break this up into 
smaller pieces and let's just take a little bit of time and money and let's validate the idea and the approach. And through that audit, we will also try to quantify what is the what is the economic impact, if it's an economic form of value that you're working towards, that we think that you and I think that we can accomplish in a larger engagement. So you're, help, you're proposing to help the client make a business case for spending the large chunk of time and money by breaking off a small piece of time and money. <clears throat> Another thing you might add to this is to guarantee the first phase. And I, this combination of things I've talked about for years. I first spoke at David Baker's MYOB 20 years ago this year. And I talked, my first talk was on pilots and diagnostics, ways to derail a pitch. And that's what we're talking about here. So you break it out into a first phase, propose to validate and quantify. And if the client is still nervous about going ahead, think about guaranteeing that first phase. So some of you have a hard time with guarantees, but some of those same people would give this stuff away for free in a pitch. So if you're willing to give away this diagnostic work for free in a pitch, then you should be willing to get paid for it and then guarantee the outcome. And what it simply means is at the end of that first phase, we'll look at the findings and recommendations We'll try as best we can to quantify the economic impact of our work. And then we'll make a proposal on how we move forward on that. And your proposal should have multiple options, three options, right? If you've read Price and Creativity, and if you haven't, what are you doing? Options solve so many problems. Um, and, and then you can add the guarantee. And if when we present the findings and recommendations, you feel like I've wasted your time and money, I want to sleep at night. We'll just give you your money back. So think about that. That's the first step. Break the engagement up into steps or phases. It's usually an audit. Consider guaranteeing the first phase. Also consider going to your client and saying, hey, if, if complexity, uncertainty, financial risk, whatever, if this is the issue um, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, so th this is basically another version of what I just talked about. Say to the client, what's the, what's the, What's the maximum amount of money that you're comfortable spending with us right now to take a first step? You tell me what that budget is that will let you sleep at night. I'll tell you what we can do for that. And the goal is some sort of validation uh, and, and quantification, but I'll tell you what we can do that for that. And then we can try on what it's like to work together. We can start to make some progress. We can get a sense of, is this a place you can get a sense of, is this a place where you want to spend the rest of this money and time? So you tell me, Madam Client, what is the amount of money that you want to spend to take a first step with me? And I'll tell you what we can do with that first step. And if the client comes back and says 10 grand, you might say, okay, well, here's what we can do for 10 grand, but here's what we can do for just a little bit more. For 20 grand, we can actually do a more meaningful first phase. You're not held to that number, but it's another principle when the client says, my budget is X. And if you put forward a proposal, one of your options has to be X for the, for the price of X. You, you, you are free to put forward more expensive options, but if the client has a stated budget and you're putting forward a proposal, you have an obligation to have one of those options be priced at what the client said their, their budget is. Um. You don't have to do what they've asked for. You just simply have to say, here's what we can do for that number. All right. So consider asking the client, what's the amount of money? Another thing you can do to get deals unstuck is, especially if it's um, uh, performance risk, is put skin in the game. If the client's like nervous, I just like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the vision, Blair. I think it's that's what we're trying to accomplish. But if I'm fully honest... If I knew you could do this, I would go ahead. If I knew you could do this. So are you willing to guarantee it? And your response might be, well, I'm not going to, I can't guarantee it fully. And maybe I, I don't want to speak for you. This is just hypothetically, maybe you want to guarantee it, but it does. it's not one or the other. It's not binary. You might say, yeah, I'm willing to put some level of guarantee. 
I'm willing to put some of that compensation at risk. I would like to share in the upside if we do. So then we're not going to get into the details of this here, but it's basically maybe you drop the fee portion by 30%, but you have a 50% bonus for hitting certain targets or a graduated uh, list of incentives that correlate with KPIs. So consider putting skin in the game. Now, it's not because this is on my list. It's simply on my list as something that you should consider. You might be in a position where you just can't take any risk or you, you have no appetite for risk. That is you as the business owner, that is entirely your decision. So on this issue of complexity, this is hard. I understand this is hard. I think the best thing we can do on the topic of complexity is just speak to the client and say, I understand this is hard. Talk to me about all of the aspects of the complexity of this. And if we think to the qualifying conversation where our job is to vet the lead to see if an opportunity exists and determine the next steps, we have this qualifying conversation framework and win without pitching. It's fairly standard or similar across multiple selling systems. One of the quadrants is decision makers. Who are the decision makers and what is the decision making process? It's the part of the qualifying conversation that we all, me too, skip over too quickly. We think we've checked that box. Oh yeah, two decision makers, et cetera. Uh Uh-uh, back up in that quadrant of who are the decision makers and what is the decision-making process? What are the decision-making dynamics? What's the relationship like between these two people? Tell me about this other person. You have a history of working well together. Do you, are you aligned? Do you have any concerns about them? Are there any people that you haven't mentioned? I know, you know, in times of economic uncertainty, finance can play a bigger role. Is there somebody in the back of your mind that you're worried about? Is there a champion on the team that maybe who isn't involved in this project that maybe it makes sense to enlist? Complexity is often a function of the individuals involved. A, we need to do a better job in the qualifying conversation. B, if we're trying to unstick a deal that is stuck because of decision-maker complexity, or it's just all so hard, a great approach is to propose to the client, how about this? I'd like to be able to help you to get all of your team members on board. So we have a really simple tool. It's called a, it's a needs assessment. Maybe it's called something else. That's a generic term. It's between eight and 12 questions. I'll send it to you or better yet, you get everybody to agree to invest 15 minutes to answer these nine questions and send the responses to me. And then you and I can have a conversation about the responses. And I promise you this, that if you can get people to agree to respond, then they will agree to attend a meeting to talk about the responses. And the needs assessment responses are going to show one of two things, either number one, everybody is perfectly aligned which is something to talk about, or number two, and highly likely, far more likely, you're not perfectly aligned and we need to get together and have a conversation. And as good as you are at your job, Mr. Client, there's something about having an outside facilitator to facilitate that conversation. So if you can get them to agree to complete this needs assessment, and you can ask them now to attend a meeting afterwards to discuss, or we can that can be a follow-on step, this might be the beginning of getting everybody aligned and getting this project unstuck. So consider getting all decision makers aligned via a needs assessment. Okay, I'm going to move quickly here. You, sub- you submitted a three-option proposal and there's no response. You call up the client. Hey, in that conversation we had when I walked you through the three options and then I I left you with the proposal, Um. Um, I'm getting the sense because I haven't, I haven't heard back from you and this just keeps dragging on is have, have we not thought about this problem or the solution properly? Would you like us to rethink some of the options that we put forward or as part of that, does it make sense for us to get together and we can do this virtually via zoom and whiteboards <clears throat> and to workshop the proposal first phase entire engagement that you think makes more sense. So just, just the proposal, we're so conditioned to thinking, okay, this is it. This is the take it or moment, take it or leave it moment. We've put the proposal and the price on the table for the client. 
all the chips are on one square. And as you know, if you've been through win without pitching training, we don't view the closing conversation or the proposal that way. It's just another step in the process. So do you need to go back and rethink that step and say to the client, do you want us to rethink some options? Will you work with us? Do you want to craft the engagement together? Last one I want to speak to here is if it's a, if it's a financial risk or I almost didn't want to put ROI on there. ROI is real. I didn't put affordability. I didn't put, a client might say, um, I really want to do this. I'm not questioning the value, Blair. I just don't have the money for this. Is there a way you can help them with the money? And the solution to that is the underutilized option of terms. Now, I'm of two minds on payment terms. The first one is, this can be a really good sales tool for us to use to help a client who otherwise can't afford us. And the second mind is when we're dealing with large CPG, large marketing based organizations and procurement departments, <clears throat> we will not have onerous terms dictated to us. I tweeted about this a little bit yesterday. I said, um, if you have a policy in your firm, a formal policy that you pay all of your suppliers within 30 days, think about that formal policy, we pay all of our suppliers within 30 days then you now have the mile, sorry, the moral high ground to push back on these clients who are asking for terms beyond 30 days and say, as a matter of policy, we don't ask our suppliers to finance us and we don't finance our clients. And, and this isn't, you can say this isn't a negotiating point. This is a point of business ethics. We start to do that. We start to stress the entire ecosystem. So it's a matter of policy where we're, cash neutral. We don't make money on the money and we don't lose money on the money. Um, so two different situations, clients are trying to impose onerous terms on you. You should push back, but terms are an often underutilized tool to help a client who will like, would like to use you can't afford to pay you, but does see the value in the work that you do think more creatively about terms. So these are eight specific um, tools that you might use in step three to address the specific challenge. Let's just recap. Oh, let's not recap. Step four, when all else fails, a lot of you know this. I've been talking about this and writing about this for years. There's one of our best performing blog posts on the website, the magic email. When you have an opportunity that has was seemed to be progressing to a close, got stuck, and the client is now ghosting you, they've just disappeared. Instead of asking again and again and again and again, wait a week or two and then send this email. Subject is closing the loop. I wanna hear in the chat if you use this and if it's working for you. I haven't heard back from you on this project, so I'm going to assume you've gone in a different direction where your priorities have changed. Let me know if we can be of assistance in the future. This just removes all the emotional weight from the decision or from the communication. You retreat politely, but not overly politely. And you wait to see what the client says in response. It'll be, yeah, yeah, we hired your biggest competitors. I've been meaning to call you. Or no, wait, don't go. All right, step one, ask why is this stuck? Step two, lift the client's gaze. Step three, address the objection. Step four, when all else fails, take it away. Who wants a puppy? Does anybody want a puppy? I want a puppy. <laughs> I just saw this puppy and had to put it in the slide. My point here, puppy aside, I got to cover up that face. This idea of why deals get stuck, this is this moment in time with these macroeconomic conditions, this is a learning moment because we need to do a better job. I'm speaking of myself too. We need to do a better job of being tuned in to the reasons why our clients don't buy from us. We need to be more empathic. We need to be more understanding. We need to assume problems and ask the client to speak to them. We need to be more direct in our conversation. What, whatever learning that we take from this webinar and from these difficult economic times, when times get good again, let's remember to hold on to that more empathic approach. Let's keep doing a better job 
of digging into like, what are the challenges the client's dealing with? What, what are their fears? What are their obstacles? How can we help? All right, Shannon, do you want to join me? It's not bad. 12 minutes left. It's oh, you good did good. Blair. Plus you gave us all that cute puppy at the end. So <laughs> it's okay. That was Puppies great. Cover a multitude of sins. Yeah, that was great that we have a lot of questions. I've been answering some questions live during the session. So I'll just jump in here and throw a couple at you. Um, Stu wants to know, can you please give some examples on the terms uh, portion that you were talking about? So some oh, examples you, you, of terms. Using terms. So yeah, you have to be careful here, <clears throat> but your standard terms might be with a new client. So a new client, you, as a matter of policy, you should get money up front. I think it should usually be somewhere around 50% of the first port fee, 50 percent of the fee portion of the first phase of the engagement, maybe as low as 33% on a really large project. But that should be a policy on new clients. And you should explain, hey, with new clients, this is how it works. With current clients, you might just, let's say you expect the engagement to be um, six months long. <clears throat> with a good client that you trust that you know is good for it, you can expend those payment terms over six months or even longer, or you can defer the first phase or sort of the, fir the first payment. It gets tricky. Like you, you never want to be upside down with, or we're seriously upside down with a new client. So that's why we get the deposit first. We still don't really know who we're dealing with. When you have a current, when you have a current long-standing good client with whom you have a good relationship, if they just need help and you can afford to do this, terms are just a great way to do it. So you can spread it over months. You can do a balloon balloon payment at like another example might be, um, let's say their fiscal year end is September 30th, and October one is the new fiscal. They might want to spend money this year, or they might prefer to spend it next year. Can you work around their fiscal budget and have the bulk of the payment be done in the year that is most beneficial to them? Great. Uh, how about this one from Katie? I'd love to know how you recommend gathering KPIs before an engagement. I've tried to gather this a few times and clients have been hesitant to share clear metrics. So some KPIs can be gathered in the sale and some require a bunch of work for you to get paid to, to, and you should get paid to do that work via selling a first phase diagnostic. When you have a client who is uncomfortable sharing KPIs with you in the sale, they have them, but they don't want to sell them. That is pointing to a larger problem. You are not dealing with somebody senior enough, or you are not seen as meaningfully different. Right. You want to be, and you, you know the difference, right? There are other sales calls you get on where you have a senior client who says, okay, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Like, let me just give you the financial background. Here's our sales numbers. Here's our margin. Here's our EBITDA last year, et cetera. They just open up the kimono and give you the financials. It's like, this is somebody who respects you, who has checked that box that, yeah, I'm confident that you can do this or something like this. And they're willing to share that information. You have another problem going on there. And so is it you're dealing with somebody too junior? You're not seen as different enough? What is it? I, uh, part of my personality, I like being playful in a moment like that. <clears throat> so let's say a uh, client doesn't want to share sales numbers. So I might say, so uh, you have sales figures, but you don't want me to know what they are because you're afraid I'll make them go higher, too high. <laughs> you should be able to hear the smile in my voice. It's absurd. It's absurd. So politely, kindly call out the absurdity. All right. Richard wants to know, do you have any advice for when a project is approved and then it stalls out of actually getting moving as quickly as they'd like anyway? He's seeing that a little more than normal right now. Well, for, you have to find out why, right? Ask the client, why is this? Hey, we got approval. That's great. It's bogging down. I'm scratching my head trying to figure out why. And here, my hypothesis is this. Is, is that what's going on? Yeah, it is. Okay. What else is going on? Anything else? 
or you don't have a hypothesis and you say, I'm like, I really have, I'm asking myself why this might be bogged down. I know there are valid reasons for it on your end, but I can't see what they are. Can you enlighten me? Maybe I can help. This idea of maybe I can help. If a recurring win without pitching theme is this idea of don't overinvest in the sale. It, once you're overinvested, your offer to help seems pretty shallow, right? If you're not overinvested, if you've been behaving like a discerning selective expert rather than a needy vendor, and you offer to help, that's seen as a more genuine offer. It's more likely, the client's more likely to take you up on it. So Jeremy has a question, and there have been a couple um, on this theme, I would say, that it might be interesting to respond to. How much do offers of breaking up the engagement, making guarantees, et cetera, project a sense of desperation um, in the sale? It seems like you could be viewed as giving up a lot of high ground um, and being seen as the expert and, and maintaining negotiating power, especially if the prospect has gone dark and you're prying for it. Yeah. So you don't offer to do the, you don't <clears throat> say, Hey, I'm, Hey, I'm going to do that. I'll do this for you. You say, would it be helpful to you if I were able to address that issue? And, and then you can get into the specifics, right? You don't want to be negotiating against yourself where you say, um, We'll break it up into phases and then, um, and we'll guarantee it. Um, and there's silence and, and we'll, and, and more and more and more that's known as negotiating against yourself. It's, um, you will seem desperate if you are behaving in a desperate manner. If you are behaving generally in the sale, like this discerning expert, you're not over invested in the sale. And you reach out to the client and say, hey, I know it's difficult times right now. I know there's a lot of uncertainty. There must be some in your organization. Um, I think this opportunity, this project still, from my point of view, still makes a lot of sense. It might not from your organization's point of view, but there might be something going on there. And um, do you mind talking about it? Like Maybe, maybe I can help. Uh, you will seem desperate if you feel desperate. Don't know what else to say other than no, that. No, well said. No, it's well said. I like this one. Um, this so Doug says he has a lot of senior leaders who seem to have full autonomy on the budget until they don't, and the CEO has to approve the final budget. It's really hard to call them out and say we don't believe you, right? Any thoughts on this? Oh, you you're great at modeling this, right? In a qualifying conversation, if I'm the client yeah. and Shannon and I role play these conversations in the workshops. And I say, no, no, <clears throat> I'm the decision maker. I just, just me. And you ask a few different ways. And then you might ask me what. I might say, so, hey, Doug, once you've made the decision with which firm you're going to hire and move forward with, does your CEO need to approve this? Do we need to pull anybody else in from that C-suite for final Any, approval? Yeah. Anybody need to approve this? Anybody need to rubber stamp this? There's no such thing as a rubber stamp, right? <laughs> It used to be. Um, so that's how you ask. It's not, I don't believe you. Yeah. yeah. It's, and I've said this line a million times, people are not immediately forthcoming about the authority that they do not have. So we start broad with decision-maker questions. Who else, in addition to yourself, who else needs to be involved? <clears throat> what? And then we get specific. Does so-and-so need to be involved? What about somebody else? Any outside consultants or advisors? No, procurement doesn't be, need to be involved. No, you won't hear from them. <clears throat> Great. Does anybody need to approve your decision once you made it? Yeah, CEO needs to sign off it. Okay, great. CEO is a decision maker. You're moving to the, the proposal or wh whomever is the decision maker. It's like, hey, can we get that person in the room? It might even be stronger language than that. Let's set up, let's set up a call with you and your soul. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I need to see it first. Like I'll take it to the CEO. <clears throat> and if that's as good as you can get, then the way we have you handle proposals and closing conversations, you'll still be okay. This is a good one. Should you use the magic email for existing clients or is it just yeah, the new client? Totally. Yeah. All right. 
here's what everybody wants to know, I think, because this has been asked a couple times. Are you going to do more of these webinars, Blair? Well, a thousand people signed up. It's probably a sign that we should. I yeah. want to do one on the value of pricing. We have to finish this study that we just started, but <clears throat> where we want to quantify what it means to you financially to do certain things differently when it comes to pricing. But um, yeah, we'll do more webinars. All right. We have two minutes left. One more question. Uh, what's your view of being on retainer with a client? Retainers are fine. Retainers are good. So my book is called Pricing Creativity for two reasons. It's a double entendre, like the pricing of your creativity, but also you should see pricing as a creative act. I think the biggest pricing mistake is to think that there is one right way to price. So if you're a PR firm, you take your client's budget, you divide it into 12 and you just assume a retainer. And maybe there's something about the nature of public relations where that makes sense. Usually. I think the mistake is to think everybody's going to be on retainer. There are some business models that have more scale where it makes sense to coalesce around a unified pricing model. Most of the firms on this webinar would not be in that category. Think creatively. Retainers are fine. But so, think beyond retainers too. Great. Thank you. So we're coming up against time. We have a lot of questions left. I'm actually going to take all of these questions that are left and I'm going to respond to them on our YouTube channel. So oh, great. We can, yeah, we can get you some answers on some of these things. So watch for some videos on YouTube uh, as related to some of these questions you asked if we didn't get to you today. Thanks, Blair. I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, and it's Shannon. I'm putting you on the spot. All right, if you need help, if you think we can help you through private uh, training or coaching or you want to talk about what it's like to be in a public workshop, <clears throat> reach out to Shannon. Um, she'll make time for you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good luck. Keep us posted. Let us know of your successes. And if you continue to get frustrated, we'd like to hear that too. We'll see you in the next webinar, whenever that is.